<laughs> welcome, 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 friends, welcome, welcome to some more Gothic Ghost Stories. Hi, everyone in the chat. It's lovely to see you all there, chatting away while we wait for the stream to begin. Um, I want to focus on this comment to begin with. Luke Entheus, who says, "Hey guys, horror weakling here. How bad are these?" Welcome along, Luke Entheus, and the answer is honestly not so spooky. Um, don't get me wrong. Uh, the stories that we read have given me a definite chill, for real. Um, but, you know, there's these stories are old. They are old. And so the likelihood is they are not going to be too unbearable for your modern horror sensibilities. Look, we've grown up with the Blair Witch and the Babadook. 
So even the great works of Bram Stoker, while definitely creepy, are probably not going to chill your bones too much. By which I mean to say, hello, hi, uh, hey, I'm Luke. We read uh, ghost stories on these streams, uh, old timey ones. Today we're going to read The Judge's House by Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker, best known for writing, you know it, Dracula in 1987. Um, but uh, this particular book that um, book that we're going to read today is a short story called The Judge's House, um, which uh, was published actually as part of an edition with Dracula. Um, there's like a, a short story collection, Dracula's Guest and other weird stories. It's called Dracula's Guest um, uh, was a uh, like a, a chapter that wasn't included in Dracula. Um, it had been taken out, I think, during the writing process, but they released it afterwards. So it's basically Dracula DLC, Dracula's Guest. Um, so we are reading a book from Dracula's Guest and other weird stories. Uh, yes, and The Judge's House, which was first published in 1891. Let's check in with the chat because everyone is saying hi. Oh, look, all of these usernames look gloriously familiar. Gentle Mandrill says, hey, Luke, glad the stream is today. Work was super stressful, and these streams are the best way to relax. Also, never read anything by Bram Stoker yet. Well, now you don't have to, because I'm going to do it for you. Um, and John Sharplin says, Long time no see, Mr. Westway. Hope you're well. Please take this cash and regale us with spooky tales of a judge in his house. Thank you, John Sharplin. Thank you for the super chat. That is really much appreciated. And Fran Fry says, I am back with a better mindset and more energy, ready for the spooks. Oh, the spookenings, they are coming. Fran Fry, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I'm glad to hear you're doing all right. Um, hello everybody. Uh, so, um, yes, so we read a ghost story, an old one, and that's what we're going to do. The Judge's House is this evening's. It is weird, and I would say, actually, of all the stories that we've read so far on these streams, I think this one actually is the darkest, um, in tone, um... Mm, do I want to say more? No, I don't think I do want to say more. I think I want to wait and see what you all think. Oh, Elisha Melia says it's my birthday today and Bram Stoker is my fave. Awesome. Uh, that's great, Elisha. Well, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Um, that's that's cool. I hope you've had a lovely day and and what a great way to um what a great way to celebrate it with some um with some spooky stories. And Growly says, do you think this story will end before City Arsenal? Yeah, football has just started in the UK again. I'm not a football fan myself, um, so I consider this uh, counter-programming. Um, you know, like uh, when when like a sort of unpopular indie movie will come out at the same time as Avengers, uh, like deliberately to capitalise on the people who don't aren't into Avengers. Um, well, that's what this uh, that's what this stream is is going to be basically. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm. If you are a football fan, I'm sorry that this is at the same time. Um, okay, right. Well, Bram Stoker probably doesn't need much introduction, but we normally uh, start with a little bit about the author. Uh, Bram Stoker, born 1847, an Irish author, best known for Dracula, of course, um, and definitely one of the uh, fathers of gothic gothic and, and romantic fiction part of the dark romanticism literary movement um we basically get um so much of gothic fiction from his work although bram stoker was introduced by many other authors as well he was part of a long creative chain uh a wonderful chain of literary learning uh, yeah, and this story is The Judge's House. So without further ado, I think... Is everyone ready to crack on? Is everyone ready to just go for it? Read a few more chats before we before we begin. Settle into... Oh, could you hear my neck cracking a little there? That was pretty spooky. Read a few messages first. Jan Stenholt says, "'Twas a bright and sunny summer evening, dot, 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 dot. Mm-hmm. Nice, moody beginning. And, um... Uh, and also, before we begin, let's do our usual disclaimer. We read these gothic ghost stories because they are interesting and fascinating and scary, 
But they are very old stories, and as such, you may encounter the real horror, which are Victorian attitudes to things like, uh, sexuality, women, uh, race, nationality, um, <laughs> colonialism, mental health, um, yet yeah, really, it like basically everything so yeah there we go there's the yeah the chance there we go disclaimer victorian attitudes yeah there we go disclaimer victorian attitudes may be contained within um okay here we go the judge's house i think you're gonna really get a kick out of this protagonist's name When the time for his examination drew near, Malcolm Malcolmson made up his mind to go somewhere to read by himself. He feared the attractions of the seaside, and also he feared completely rural isolation, for of old he knew its charms, and so he determined to find some unpretentious little town where there would be nothing to distract him. He refrained from asking suggestions from any of his friends, for he argued that each would recommend some place of which he had knowledge and where he had already acquaintances. As Malcolmson wished to avoid friends, he had no wish to encumber himself with the attention of friends' friends, and so he determined to look out for a place for himself. He packed a portmanteau with some clothes and all the books he required, and then took ticket for the first name on the local timetable which he did not know. When at the end of three hours' journey he alighted at Benchurch, he felt satisfied that he had so far obliterated his tracks as to be sure of having a peaceful opportunity of pursuing his studies. He went straight to the one inn which the sleepy little place contained and put up for the night. Benchurch was a market town and once in three weeks was crowded to excess, but for the remainder of the 21 days it was as attractive as a desert. Malcolmson looked around the day after his arrival to try to find quarters more isolated than ever so quiet an inn as the good traveller afforded. There was only one place which took his fancy, and it certainly satisfied his wildest ideas regarding quiet. In fact, quiet was not the proper word to apply to it. Desolation was the only term conveying any suitable idea of its isolation. It was an old, rambling, heavy-built house of the Jacobean style, with heavy gables and windows, unusually small and set higher than was customary in such houses, and was surrounded with a high brick wall massively built. Indeed, on examination, it looked more like a fortified house than an ordinary dwelling. But all these things pleased Malcolmson. Here, he thought, is the very spot I have been looking for, and if I can get opportunity of using it, I shall be happy. His joy was increased when he realised beyond doubt that it was not at present inhabited. From the post office he got the name of the agent, who was rarely surprised at the application to rent a part of the old house. Mr Carnford, the local lawyer and agent, was a genial old gentleman, and frankly confessed his delight at anyone being willing to live in the house. To tell you the truth, said he, I should be only too happy on behalf of the owners to let anyone have the house rent free for a term of years if only to accustom the people here to see it inhabited. It has been so long empty that some kind of absurd prejudice has grown up about it, and this can be best put down by its occupation, if only, he added with a sly glance at Malcolmson, by a scholar like yourself, who wants its quiet for a time. Malcolmson thought it needless to ask the agent about the absurd prejudice. He knew he would get more information if he should require it on that subject from other quarters. He paid his three months' rent, got a receipt, and the name of an old woman who would probably undertake to do for him, and came away with the keys in his pocket. He then went to the landlady of the inn, who was a cheerful and most kindly person, and asked her advice as to such stores and provisions as he would be likely to require. She threw up her hands in amazement when he told her where he was going to settle himself. Not in the judge's house, she said, and grew pale as she spoke. He explained the locality of the house, saying that he did not know its name. When he had finished, she answered, Aye, oh, sure enough, sure enough, the very place it is the judge's house, sure enough. He asked her to tell him about the place, why it is so called, and what there was against it. 
She told him that it was so-called locally because it had been many years before, how long she could not say as she was herself from another part of the country, but she thought it must have been a hundred years or more, the abode of a judge who was held in great terror on account of his harsh sentences and his hostility to prisoners at Assizes. As to what there was against the house itself, she could not tell. She had often asked, but no one could inform her, but there was a general feeling that there was something. And for her own part, she would not take all the money in Drinkwater's bank and stay in the house an hour by herself. Then she apologised to Malcolmson for her disturbing talk. It is too bad of me, sir, and, and you and a young gentleman too, if, if you will pardon me saying it, going to live there all alone. If you were my boy, and you'll excuse me for saying it, you wouldn't sleep there a night, not if I had to go there myself and pull the big alarm bell that's on the roof. The good creature was so manifestly in earnest, and was so kindly in her intentions, that Malcolmson, although amused, was touched. He told her kindly how much he appreciated her interest in him, and added... But my dear Mrs. Witham, indeed you need not be concerned about me. A man who is reading from, for the mathematical troupos has too much to think of to be disturbed by any of these mysterious somethings, and his work is of too exact and prosaic a kind to allow of his having any corner of his mind for mysteries of, of any kind. Harmonical progression, permutations and combinations, and elliptic functions have sufficient mysteries for me. Mrs. Witham kindly undertook to see after his commissions, and he went himself to look for the old woman who had been recommended to him. When he returned to the judge's house with her, after an interval of a couple of hours, he found Mrs. Witham herself waiting with several men and boys carrying parcels, and an upholsterer's bag with a bed in a car, for, she said, though tables and chairs might be all very well, a bed that hadn't been aired for mayhap fifty years was not proper for young bones to lie on. She was evidently curious to see the inside of the house, and though manifestly so afraid of the somethings that at the slightest sound she clutched on to Malcolmson, whom she never left for a moment as he went over the whole place. Let's take a uh, small break there. So, spooky house. Studying for the exams? Why not go stay in a haunted house? Good idea. Mm-hmm. Gobi Morris says, Oh no, not another spooky bed. That's right. It's a full spooky bed situation. David Badlody, thank you very much for the uh, super chat. Says, can't stay. Can't wait to catch this later. Well, get out of here, David. No, no spoilers. Uh, and Dan in the chat says, I think Malcolm Malcolmson is my favourite character name ever. Top work, Bram. It is good. It is good. Um... Yeah, I would say not an especially sympathetic introduction to your protagonist, Malcolm Malcolmson. He seems um, like a lot of the protagonists in these horror stories. He's, um, what is he? He's, uh, he's a little smug. He, uh, he thinks himself above being haunted to death. Well, we will see. Nimble Tack says, why is there an alarm bell? What a good question, Nimble Tack. Why don't we read on? And find out. Our Ariam says, Hi Luke, I wanted to say you're my favourite person on YouTube, shucks. And I'm super excited to share my first live stream story adventure with everyone. Welcome along. Welcome. You are so welcome. If you are watching for the first time, then welcome along. Well, we are so glad to have you with us. You will find the chat a very friendly and welcoming place. Um, oh, something I forgot to mention at the beginning. At the end of this stream, my good friend and friend of the Outside Xbox and Outside Extra channels, Andrew Hoyle, is doing a uh, photo editing live stream. He's he's an incredible photographer. Uh, he took the photos if you were if you're a fan of um, uh, Outside Extra and the charity single we did last year. He took the photos for that, the promo photos, um, the amazing portraits of our D and D characters, and he's doing a uh, he's doing a photo editing live stream. Um, uh, I think at, at the at nine at nine thirty. So we'll try and finish this for when that happens, so that you can hop over to watch that because he's going to be editing photos based on um, rolling a d twenty, which is a really cool idea, and I'm really excited to see how it goes um, and and how that plays out. And I think yeah, you'll end up with some really weird photos. And I believe, I believe they don't quote me on this that he is actually going to be editing um, 
or re-editing some of those Oxventure portraits. So if you are an outside extra or outside Xbox fan, then yeah, you'll definitely want to check that out. It will be great. But there's a whole lot of spooky stories um, between uh, between now and then. Um, but I will provide you with a link when our stream comes to a close. Okay. Here we go. Our uh, Vivian Sassadaran says, Andy from the Animal Crossing New Horizons fame. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It is It is Crumpet who appears on the um, uh, on my Animal Crossing New Horizons streams quite regularly because he's just always ready for a fishing challenge. Always. Okay. Right. Let's crack on. We're exploring the house. After his examination of the house, Malcolmson decided to take up his abode in the great dining room which was big enough to serve for all his requirements, and Mrs. Witham, with the aid of the charwoman, Mrs. Dempster, proceeded to arrange matters. When the hampers were brought in and unpacked, Malcolmson saw that with much kind forethought she had sent from her own kitchen sufficient provisions to last for a few days. Before going, she expressed all sorts of kind wishes, and at the door turned and said, and perhaps, uh, as the room is big and draughty, it might be well to have one of those big screens put round your bed at night. Though, truth to tell, I, I would die myself if I were to be so shut in with all kinds of... All kinds of things that put their heads round the sides or over the top and look on me. The image which she called up was too much for her nerves, and she fled incontinently. Mrs. Dempster sniffed in a superior manner as the landlady disappeared and remarked that for her own part, she wasn't afraid of all the bogies in the kingdom. I'll tell you what it is, sir, she said. Bogies is all kinds and sorts of things except bogies. Rats and mice and beetles and creaky doors and loose slates and broken panes and stiff drawer handles that stay out when you pull them and then fall down in the middle of the night. Look at the wainscot of the room. It is old, hundreds of years old. Do you think there's no rats and beetles there? And do you imagine, sir, that you won't see none of them? Rats is bogies, I tell you, and bogies is rats. And don't you get to think anything else? Mrs. Dempster, said Malcolmson gravely, making her a polite bow. You know more than a senior wrangler. And let me say that, as a mark of esteem for your indubitable soundness of head and heart, I shall, when I go, give you possession of this house and let you stay here by yourself for the last two months of my tenancy. For four weeks will serve my purpose. Thank you kindly, sir, she answered, but I couldn't sleep away from home at night. I am in greenhouse charity, and if I slept a night away from my rooms, I should lose all I've got to live on. The rules is very strict, and there's too many watching for a vacancy for me to run any risks in the matter. Only for that, sir, I'd gladly come here and attend on you altogether during your stay. My good woman, said Malcolmson hastily, I've come here on purpose to obtain solitude, and I believe that I am grateful to the late Greenhow for having so organised his admirable charity, whatever it is, that I am perforce denied the opportunity of suffering from such a form of temptation. St. Anthony himself could not be more rigid on the point. The old woman laughed harshly. Ah, <laughs> you old gentleman, she said. You don't fear for naught, and belike you'll get all the solitude you want here. She set to work with her cleaning, and by nightfall, when Malcolmson returned from his walk, he always had one of his books to study as he walked, he found the room swept and tidied, a fire burning in the old hearth, the lamp lit, and the table spread for supper, with Mrs. Witham's excellent fare. This is comfort indeed, he said as he rubbed his hands. When he had finished his supper, and lifted the tray to the other end of the great oak dining table, he got out his books again, put some fresh wood on the fire, trimmed his lamp, and set himself down to a spell of real hard work. He went on without pause till about eleven o'clock, when he knocked off for a bit to fix his fire and lamp and to make himself a cup of tea. He had always been a tea drinker, and during his college life had sat late at work and taken tea late. The rest was a great luxury to him, and he enjoyed it with a sense of delicious, voluptuous ease. The renewed fire leapt and sparkled, and threw quaint shadows through the great old room, and as he sipped his hot tea, he revelled in the sense of isolation from his kind. Then it was that he began to notice for the first time what a noise the rats were making. Surely, he thought, they could not have been at it all the time I was reading, 
And had they been, I must have noticed it. Presently, when the noise increased, he satisfied himself that it was really new. It was evident that at first the rats had been frightened at the presence of a stranger and the light of fire and lamp, but that as the time went on they had grown bolder and were now disporting themselves as was their wont. And how busy they were! And hark to the strange noises! Up and down behind the old wainscot, over the ceiling and under the floor they raced and gnawed and scratched. Malcolmson smiled to himself as he recalled to mind the saying of Mrs Dempster, Bogies is rats and rats is bogies. The tea began to have its effect of intellectual and nervous stimulus. He saw with joy another long spell of work to be done before the night was passed. And in the sense of security which it gave him, he allowed himself the luxury of a good look round the room. He took his lamp in one hand and went all around, wondering that so quaint and beautiful an old house had been so long neglected. The carving of the oak on the panels of the wainscot was fine, and on and round the doors and windows it was beautiful and of rare merit. There were some old pictures on the walls, but they were coated so thick with dust and dirt that he could not distinguish any detail of them, though he held his lamp as high as he could over his head. Here and there as he went round he saw some crack or hole blocked for a moment by the face of a rat with its bright eyes glittering in the light. But in an instant it was gone, and a squeak and a scamper followed. The thing that most struck him, however, was the rope of the great alarm bell on the roof, which hung down in a corner of the room on the right-hand side of the fireplace. He pulled up close to the hearth a great high-backed carved oak chair, and sat down to his last cup of tea. When this was done, he made up the fire and went back to his work, sitting at the corner of the table, having the fire to his left. For a little while the rats disturbed him somewhat with their perpetual scampering, but he got accustomed to the noise as one does to the ticking of a clock or the roar of moving water, and he became so immersed in his work that everything in the world except the problem which he was trying to solve passed away from him. He suddenly looked up. His problem was still unsolved, and there was in the air that sense of the hour before the dawn, which is so dread to doubtful life. The noise of the rats had ceased. Indeed, it seemed to him that it must have ceased but lately, and that it was the sudden cessation which had disturbed him. The fire had fallen low, but still it threw out a deep red glow. As he looked, he started in spite of his sang-froid. There, on the great high-backed carved oak chair, by the right side of the fireplace, sat an enormous rat, steadily glaring at him with baleful eyes. He made a motion to it as though to hunt it away, but it did not stir. Then he made the motion of throwing something. Still it did not stir, but showed its great white teeth angrily, and its cruel eyes shone in the lamplight with an added vindictiveness. Malcolmson felt amazed, and seizing the poker from the hearth, ran at it to kill it. Before, however, he could strike it, the rat, with a squeak that sounded like the concentration of hate, jumped upon the floor, and, running up the rope of the alarm bell, disappeared in the darkness beyond the range of the green-shaded lamp. Instantly, that is to say, the noisy scampering of the rats in the wainscot began again. By this time, Malcolmson's mind was quite off the problem, and as a shrill cockcrow outside told him of the approach of morning, he went to bed and to sleep. Let's take a break there. Ooh -hoo 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 -hoo. Okay. So, we have rats. So many rats. So many rats in the walls. So many rats in the walls that the noise is deafening. Uh, and that you only notice that the noise when it stops. Because that's when you notice the gigantic rat. The gigantic... The, 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 clearly there's some sort of chief rat. Sat on the huge chair. Absolutely horrible. Absolutely horrible. 
Um, so, there we go. That's the situation, folks. A lot of rats. Anna Petrovic says, I'd rather have spiders. Hmm. No, I'd rather have rats, personally, but, um, yeah. I'm not keen on either. Laura Dealey speaks for many of you in the chat, saying he seems far too chill with the whole rat scenario. Yeah, well, I guess sh should we try and bear in mind, perhaps, that this is Victorian times? And I guess maybe it was more common to see rats just everywhere? I don't know. Uh, Zizahan says, I read this one as a child. Just nope. Oh, Zizahan's Thanks for sticking with it. Thanks for revisiting that childhood terror. Hmm. Yeah. Sarah Franchella says, I don't know if you've ever had a rat problem, but the scratching from inside the wall is very annoying. That's interesting. I never have had a rat problem. Touch wood. Yeah, luckily, I've never had... Um, never had a rat problem, but... Uh, I've had mice before, it's, but it's not so bad, is it? You're all right with a mouse. I mean, you don't want to have a mouse problem, but if you see a mouse running across the floor, that's a different proposition to just seeing a huge rat. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I don't know what the worst thing is. Shy Violet says, I have a raccoon problem, and OMG, so noisy. And Rebecca M says, yeah, we have to we have to get on to this. Um, I just want to renote the phrases fled incontinently <laughs> and voluptuous ease. Yeah, voluptuous ease is a lovely phrase. Um, fled incontinently. When I read this story for the first time, I would read read that line. She fled incontinently and thought, oh, man, they're all going to they're all going to lose it at that. They're all that's going to break the mood. How am I supposed to read through something like fled incontinently? Bram Stoker. How am I supposed to create? How am I supposed to to cre to create a mood when you just throw the words "fled incontinently" into your story, which obviously is immediately distracting to everyone and hilarious. It's not supposed to be hilarious. <laughs> there you go. All right. Shall we keep going? Maybe everything will turn out well. Maybe everything will be fine. Maybe the rats are just trying to help. So, Malcolm Malcolmson has gone to bed, having encountered many rats. He slept so sound that he was not even waked by Mrs. Dempster coming in to make up his room. It was only when she had tidied up the place and got his breakfast ready and tapped on the screen which closed in his bed that he woke. He was a little tired still after his night's hard work, but a strong cup of tea soon freshened him up and, taking his book, he went out for his morning walk, bringing with him a few sandwiches, lest he should not care to return till dinner time. He found a quiet walk between high elms some way outside the town, and here he spent the greater part of the day studying his Laplace. On his return, he looked in to see Mrs Witham and to thank her for her kindness. When she saw him coming through the diamond-paned bay window of her sanctum, she came out to meet him and asked him in. She looked at him searchingly and shook her head as she said, You must not overdo it, sir. You are paler this morning than you should be. Two late hours and too hard work on the brain isn't good for any man. But tell me, sir, how did you pass the night? Well, I hope, but my heart, sir, I was glad when Mrs Dempster told me this morning that you were all right and sleeping sound when she went in. Oh, I was all right, he answered, smiling. The sump things didn't worry me as yet, only the rats. And they had a circus, I can tell you, all over the place. There was one wicked-looking old devil that sat up on my own chair by the fire and wouldn't go till I took the poker to him. And then he ran up the rope of the alarm bell and got to somewhere up the wall or the ceiling. I couldn't see where, it was so dark. Mercy on us, said Mrs Witham, an old devil and sitting by the, on the chair, chair by the fireside. Take care, sir, take care, there's many a true word spoken in jest. How do you mean? Upon my word, I, I don't understand. 
An old devil? The old devil, perhaps? There, sir, you needn't laugh. For Malcolmson had broken into a hearty peal. You young folks thinks it's easy to laugh at things that make older ones shudder. Never mind, sir, never mind. Please, God, you'll laugh all the time. It's what I wish you myself. And the good lady beamed all over in sympathy with his enjoyment. Her fears gone for a moment. Forgive me, said Malcolmson presently. Don't think me rude, but the idea was too much for me that the old devil himself was on the chair last night. And at the thought he laughed again. And then he went home to dinner. This evening, the scampering of the rats began earlier. Indeed, it had been going on before his arrival, and only ceased whilst his presence by its freshness disturbed them. After dinner, he sat by the fire for a while and had a smoke, and then, having cleared his table, began to work as before. Tonight the rats disturbed him more than they had done on the previous night. How they scampered up and down and under and over. How they squeaked and scratched and gnawed. How they, getting bolder by degrees, came to the mouths of their holes and to the chinks and cracks and crannies in the wainscoting till their eyes shone like tiny lamps as the firelight rose and fell. But to him, now doubtless accustomed to them, their eyes were not wicked, only their playfulness touched him. Sometimes the boldest of them made sallies out onto the floor or along the mouldings of the wainscot. Now and again, as they disturbed him, Malcolmson made a sound to frighten them, smiting the table with his hand, or giving a fierce, hush, hush, so they fled straight away to their holes. And so the early part of the night wore on, and despite the noise, Malcolmson got more and more immersed in his work. All at once he stopped as on the previous night being overcome by a sudden sense of silence. There was not the faintest sound of gnaw or scratch or squeak. The silence was as of the grave. He remembered the odd occurrence of the previous night, and instinctively he looked at the chair standing close by the fireside, and then a very odd sensation thrilled through him. There on the great old high-backed carved oak chair beside the fireplace sat the same enormous rat, steadily glaring at him with baleful eyes. Instinctively, he took the nearest thing to his hand, a book of logarithms, and flung it at it. The book was badly aimed and the rat did not stir. So again, the poker performance of the previous night was repeated, and again, the rat, being closely pursued, fled up the rope of the alarm bell. Strangely, too, the departure of this rat was instantly followed by the renewal of the noise made by the general rat community. On this occasion, as on the previous one, Malcolmson could not see at what part of the room the rat disappeared, for the green shade of his lamp left the upper part of the room in darkness, and the fire had burned low. On looking at his watch, he found it was close on midnight, and, not sorry for the divertissement, he made up his fire and made himself his nightly pot of tea. He had got through a good spell of work, and, and thought himself entitled to a cigarette, and so he sat on the great oak chair before the fire, and enjoyed it. Whilst smoking, he began to think that he would like to know where the rat disappeared to, for he had certain ideas for the morrow not entirely disconnected with a rat trap. Accordingly, he lit another lamp and placed it so that it would shine well into the right-hand corner of the wall by the fireplace. Then he got all the books he had with him and placed them handy to throw at the vermin. Finally, he lifted the rope of the alarm bell and placed the end of it on the table, fixing the extreme end under the lamp. As he handled it, he could not help noticing how pliable it was, especially for so strong a rope and one not in use. You could hang a man with it, he thought to himself. When his preparations were made, he looked around and said complacently, There now, my friend, I think we shall learn something of you this time. He began his work again, and though, as before, somewhat disturbed at first by the noise of the rats, soon lost himself in his propositions and his problems. Again, he was called to his immediate surroundings suddenly. This time it might not have been the sudden silence only which took his attention. There was a slight movement of the rope, and the lamp moved. Without stirring, he looked to see if his pile of books was within range, and then cast his eye along the rope. As he looked, he saw the great rat drop from the rope on the oak armchair, and sit there glaring at him. He raised a book in his right hand, and taking careful aim, flung it at the rat. The latter, with a quick movement, sprang aside and dodged the missile. 
He then took another book and a third and flung them one after another at the rat, but each time unsuccessfully. At last, as he stood with a book poised in his hand to throw, the rat squeaked and seemed afraid. This made Malcolmson more than ever eager to strike, and the book flew and struck the rat a resounding blow. It gave a terrified squeak, and turning on his pursuer a look of terrible malevolence, ran up the chair back and made a great jump to the rope of the alarm bell and ran up it like lightning. The lamp rocked under the sudden strain, but it was a heavy one and did not topple over. Malcolmson kept his eyes on the rat and saw it by the light of the second lamp leap to a moulding of the wainscot and disappear through a hole in one of the great pictures which hung on the wall, obscured and invisible through its coating of dirt and dust. I shall look up my friend's habitation in the morning, said the student as he went over to collect his books. The third picture from the fireplace I shall not forget. He picked up the books one by one, commenting on them as he lifted them up. Conic sections, he does not mind, nor cycloidal oscillations, nor the Principia, nor quatern Quaternions, nor the Thermodynamics. And now for the book that fetched him. Malcolmson took it up and looked at it. As he did so, he started, and a sudden pallor overspread his face. He looked round uneasily and, and shivered slightly as he murmured to himself, The Bible my mother gave me. What an odd coincidence. He sat down to work again, and the rats in the wainscot renewed their gambols. They did not disturb him, however. Somehow their presence gave him a sense of companionship. But he could not attend to his work, and after striving to master the subject on which he was engaged, gave it up in despair, and went to bed as the first streak of dawn stole in through the eastern window. Let's take a break. Let's take a break there. So, what do we think is going on? What a coincidence that the uh, what a coincidence that the Bible should be the book that uh, that hits the rat. I think the thing that struck me most about this section that we just read is the bit where Malcolmson um, uh, is, is about to throw the book and the rat squeaks squeaked and seemed afraid this made malcolmson more than ever eager to strike it's it's that it's like oh he's he's mad he's vengeful he's uh yeah he's not holding back i love the names of all the books as well that, that are being read one i really struggled with there quaternions quatern quaternions conic sections cycloidal oscillations the principia Quaternions and thermodynamics. Should we see what that is? Should we look it up? Quaternions. In mathematics, the quaternions are a number system that extends the complex numbers. I'm none the wiser. They were first described by Irish mathematician William Rowan Hamilton in 1843. Ah, so relatively new mathematics at this point, relatively. And applied to mechanics in three-dimensional space. A feature of quaternions is that multiplication of two quaternions is non-communicative. No, non-commutative. Non okay, well, look, I just said a whole bunch of math stuff. It didn't make any sense to me. Um, maybe it made sense to you if you're watching. Congratulations. If so, you might be quite clever. All right. So, how are we enjoying the story so far? Uh, yeah, let me know in the chat. Let me know how it's going. How creepy are we finding this so far? How creep? How 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 spooked are we by this whole rat situation? Zizahans, who mentioned reading this as a child, says, "Don't get me wrong. I love this story. It just terrified me. I had nightmares for years. Oh no, nightmares for years. I'm sorry, Zizahans." Danny McNamara says, I want to pet the rats. Yeah, a lot of the rats seem friendly. In fact, the rats seem to be uh, a sort of friendly influence um, by the end there. But maybe that's just because the, uh, the the main big rat is so scary and full on. Uh, sorry, by the way, if you're picking up a little noise on the mic. It's just started raining very heavily here. It's The sky is really darkened outside. It's all gone quite appropriate, shall we say, for a, for a gothic... Horror story. 
Denise L says, more rap stories, please. <laughs> and Annika Brock says, I like rats, so I'm yet to be scared. Ah, uh, yeah, and Gareth the Great says the real antagonist is Malcolm. Well, he did throw a book at the rat, even though it squeaked and seemed afraid, which, you know, harsh, harsh, IMO. Oh, Shy Violet says, why didn't I think of this? It's not rain, Luke, it's the rats in the walls making the noise. Okay, well, I'm looking around at the other chairs in the room and I don't see any massive rats on them, so... Hopefully I'm all right for now. Emma Rose says, I have 12 rats. I bet if you've got pet rats, then this, that puts a different spin on this story. I think to me, seeing a rat has, A, the terror of, ah, a big animal. It might bite me and I might get the plague. <laughs> the plague. And B, like, oh no, a rat. This is, this is not just creepy, but a massive, massive logistical hassle. Because if there's a rat in my house, then you have to, like, pay someone to come out and to like deal with the rats and then there's going to be dead rats and it might not work and it's going to be expensive it's it's a nightmare um <laughs> best bloomer says you do have a fireplace and a lot of books around you luke yeah i do yeah mm, just checking out that fireplace it's all right it's all very cozy in here Meryl Squirrel says, trouble is, if you see one rat, you know there are a few dozen more nearby. Yep. Um, okay, right. Shall we crack on? He slept heavily but uneasily, and dreamed much, and when Mrs. Dempster woke him late in the morning, he seemed ill at ease, and for a few minutes did not seem to realise exactly where he was. His first request rather surprised the servant. Mrs. Dempster, when I'm out today, I wish you would get the steps and dust or wash those pictures, specifically that one, third from the fireplace. I want to see what they are. Late in the afternoon, Malcolmson worked at his books in the shaded walk, and the cheerfulness of the previous day came back to him as the day wore on, and he found that his reading was progressing well. He had worked out to a satisfactory conclusion all the problems which had as yet baffled him, and it was in a state of jubilation that he paid a visit to Mrs. Witham at The Good Traveller. He found a stranger in the cosy sitting room with the landlady, who was introduced to him as Dr. Thornhill, she was not quite at ease, and this, combined with the doctor's plunging at once into a series of questions, made Malcolmson come to the conclusion that his presence was not an accident. So, without preliminary, he said, Dr Thornhill, I, I shall with pleasure answer you any question you may choose to ask me, if you will answer me one question first. The doctor seemed surprised, but he smiled and answered at once, Done, well, what is it? Did Mrs Wytham ask you to come here and see me and advise me? Dr Thornhill for a moment was taken aback and Mrs Witham got fiery red and turned away but the doctor was a frank and ready man and he answered at once and openly. She did but she didn't intend you to know it. I suppose it was my clumsy haste that made you suspect. She told me that she did not like the idea of your being in that house all by yourself and that she thought you took too much strong tea. In fact she wants me to advise you if possible to give up the tea and the very late hours. I was a keen student in my time, so I suppose I must take the liberty of a college man, and without offence, advise you not quite as a stranger. Malcolmson, with a bright smile, held out his hand. Shake, as they say in America, he said. I must thank you for your kindness, and Mrs. Witham too, and your kindness deserves a return on my part. I promise to take no more strong tea, no tea at all, till you let me, and I shall go to bed tonight at one o'clock at latest. Will that do? Capital, said the doctor. Now tell us all that you noticed in the old house. And so Malcolmson then and there told in minute detail all that had happened in the last two nights. He was interrupted every now and then by um, by some exclamation from Mrs. Witham, till finally when he told of the episode of the Bible, the landlady's pent-up emotions found vent in a shriek, and it was not till a stiff glass of brandy and water had been administered that she grew composed again. 
Dr Thornhill listened with a face of growing gravity, and when the narrative was complete and Mrs Witham had been restored, he asked, The rat always went up the rope of the alarm bell? Always. I suppose you know, said the doctor after a pause, what the rope is? No. It is, said the doctor slowly, the very rope which the hangman used for all the victims of the judge's judicial rancour. Here he was interrupted by another scream from Mrs Witham, and steps had to be taken for her recovery. Malcolmson, having looked at his watch and found that it was close to dinner hour, had gone home before her complete recovery. When Mrs Witham was herself again, she almost assailed the doctor with angry questions as to what he meant by putting such horrible ideas into the poor young man's mind. He has quite enough there already to upset him, she added. Dr Thornhill replied, My dear madam, I had a distinct purpose in it. I wanted to draw his attention to the bell rope and to fix it there. It may be that he is in a highly overwrought state and has been studying too much, although I am bound to say that he seems as sound and healthy a young man, mentally and bodily, as ever I saw. But then the rats and that suggestion of the devil. The doctor shook his head and went on. I would have offered to go and stay the first night with him, but that I felt sure it would have been a cause of offence. He may get in the night some strange fright or hallucination, and if he does I want him to pull that rope. All alone as he is, it will give us warning, and we may reach him in time to be of service. I shall be sitting up pretty late tonight and shall keep my ears open. Do not be alarmed if Ben Church gets a surprise before morning. Oh, Doctor, what do you mean? What do you mean? I mean this, that possibly, nay, more probably, we shall hear the great alarm bell from the judge's house tonight. And the Doctor made about as, an eff as effective an exit as could be thought of. When Malcolmson arrived home, he found that it was a little after his usual time, and Mrs Dempster had gone away. The rules of Greenhouse Charity were not to be neglected. He was glad to see that the place was bright and tidy, with a cheerful fire and a well-trimmed lamp. The evening was colder than might have been expected in April, and a heavy wind was blowing with such rapidly increasing strength that there was every promise of a storm during the night. For a few minutes after his entrance, the noise of the rats ceased. But so soon as they became accustomed to his presence, they began again. He was glad to hear them, for he felt once more the feeling of companionship in their noise, and his mind ran back to the strange fact that they only ceased to manifest themselves when that other, the great rat with the baleful eyes, came upon the scene. The reading lamp only was lit, and its green shade kept the ceiling and the upper part of the room in darkness, so that a cheerful light from the hearth, spreading over the floor and shining on the white cloth laid over the end of the table, was warm and cheery. Malcolmson sat down to his dinner with a good appetite and a buoyant spirit. After his dinner and a cigarette, he sat steadily down to work, determined not to let anything disturb him, for he remembered his promise to the doctor and made up his mind to make the best of the time at his disposal. Take one more little break there. Hmm. So, this doctor has been called in by Mrs. Witham to try and, uh, I guess to try and, um, I, I guess she's worried about him. I guess she's worried about the, the I guess she's worried about Malcolm Malcolmson. And who wouldn't be? Because he's choosing by, by will to, to leave university and stay in a haunted house for a month or however long. Um, which I call peculiar behaviour, but yeah, Mrs. Witham, I think that was nice of Mrs. Witham. She's sort of portrayed, like, you've got the impression that she was just kind of panicky. Maybe she's just calling the doctor because she's a bit sort of worked up, but I don't know. Um, I kind of think, I think she, um, yeah, she goes up in my estimation a little bit at that point in the story. Uh, yeah, let, let me know what you think of the, um, in the chat of the, uh, <laughs> the other characters Meryl Squirrel says the dude really needs to just have a word with his landlord about the rat problem <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh. just read a very interesting comment that I don't want to read out but I want to come back to when we finish the story 
That is interesting. Well, Lucy Harvey Plummer says, OK, but as a uni student in the midst of final assignments, I completely get where he was coming from with leaving uni to stay in a haunted house. <laughs> OK, well, yeah, maybe it's um, maybe it's maybe it's preferable. <laughs> Eva says the solution is probably brandy. We have had a mention of brandy, haven't we? Um, it was used to uh, calm down Mrs. Witham, wasn't it? Brandy and water. Sorry, one sec. Right. Sorry, I lost the chat there. Uh, Nimble Tax says, could do with some brandy myself about now. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I could as well. There's just water in this. I, prob I probably should start... I probably should start drinking some... Uh, some malted liquor of some kind on these streams, shouldn't I? It's just... It's just more moody. Um, what is it? Port. Port is what... Port is what I need. I need port. Uh, all right. For next time. For next time. I'm going to have a little... I'm going to have a, a little snifter of port ready. Let me know what you're drinking at home or eating. <laughs> Emily Price says, yes, Luke. Get drunk on stream. Yeah, all right. No, we're not drunk. We're not drunk. These stories are hard enough to read stone cold sober. <laughs> okay, right. Oh, good. Everyone's saying what they're drinking. Apple and peanut butter. Nice. Hot chocolate. Oh, hot chocolate from Fancy Space Owl. Hot chocolate. Oh, I'd go for hot chocolate. Beth Bloom is having appropriately moody red wine. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Smart. Smart. <laughs> oh, Andy, who's streaming later, is drinking gin right now. Which should um, which should spice up the uh, the live stream later that he's doing. <laughs> cool. Okay. Should we keep going? Elisha Melia, I'm eating chocolate and drinking hot Vimto. Oh my gosh. Emily Price, brown soda. Wilgram's drinking beer. All right. Loving everyone, loving everyone's drinks. We should do this. Is we should check in with the stream this way. In the when we start these streams, we should we should do like a what's everyone drinking check in. Okay, here we go. Let's read on. <clears throat> so Malcolmson has sat down to dinner he's had a cigarette he's made up his mind to make the best of the time at his disposal for an hour or so he worked all right and then his thoughts began to wander from his books the actual circumstances around him the calls on his physical attention and his nervous susceptibility were not to be denied. By this time, the wind had become a gale, and the gale a storm. The old house, solid though it was, seemed to shake to its foundations, and the storm roared and raged through its many chimneys and its queer old gables, producing strange, unearthly sounds in the empty rooms and corridors. Even the great alarm bell on the roof must have felt the force of the wind, for the rope rose and fell slightly as though the bell were moved a little from time to time and the limber rope fell on the oak floor with a hard and hollow sound. As Malcolmson listened to it, he bethought himself of the doctor's words. It is the rope which the hangman used for the victims of the judge's judicial rancor. And he went over to the corner of the fireplace and took it in his hand to look at it. There seemed a sort of deadly interest in it, and as he stood there, 
He lost himself for a moment in speculation as to who these victims were, and the grim wish of the judge to have such a ghastly relic ever under his eyes. As he stood there, the swaying of the bell on the roof still lifted the rope now and again, but presently there came a new sensation, a sort of tremor in the rope, as though something was moving along it. Looking up instinctively, Malcolmson saw the great rat coming slowly down towards him, glaring at him steadily. He dropped the rope and started back with a muttered curse, and the rat turning ran up the rope again and disappeared. And at the same instant, Malcolmson became, became conscious that the noise of the rats, which had ceased for a while, began again. All this had set him thinking, and it occurred to him that he had not investigated the lair of the rat or looked at the pictures as he had intended. He lit the other lamp without the shade, and holding it up went and stood opposite the third picture from the fireplace on the right hand side where he had seen the rat disappear on the previous night. At the first glance he started back so suddenly that he almost dropped the lamp, and a deadly pallor overspread his face. His knees shook and heavy drops of sweat came on his forehead and he trembled like an aspen. But he was young and plucky and he pulled himself together and after the pause of a few seconds, stepped forward again, raised the lamp, and examined the picture which had been dusted and washed, and now stood out clearly. It was of a judge, dressed in his robes of scarlet and ermine. His face was strong and merciless, evil, crafty and vindictive, with a sensual mouth, hooked nose of ruddy colour and shaped like the beak of a bird of prey. The rest of the face was of a cadaverous colour. The eyes were of peculiar brilliance and with a terribly malignant expression. As he looked at them, Malcolmson grew cold, for he saw there the very counterpart of the eyes of the great rat. The lamp almost fell from his hand. He saw the rat with its baleful eyes peering out through the hole in the corner of the picture and noted the sudden cessation of the noise of the other rats. However, he pulled himself together and went on with his examination of the picture. The judge was seated in a great high-backed carved oak chair on the right-hand side of a great stone fireplace where, in the corner, a rope hung down from the ceiling, its end lying coiled on the floor. With a feeling of something like horror, Malcolmson recognised the scene of the room as it stood and gazed around him in a in an awestruck manner as though he expected to find some strange presence behind him. Then he looked over to the corner of the fireplace, and with a loud cry he let the lamp fall from his hand. There, in the judge's armchair, with the rope hanging behind, sat the rat with the judge's baleful eyes, now intensified and with a fiendish leer, save for the howling of the storm without, there was silence. The fallen lamp recalled Malcolmson to himself, Fortunately, it was of metal and so the oil was not spilt. However, the practical need of attending to it settled at once his nervous apprehensions. When he had turned it out, he wiped his brow and thought for a moment. This will not do, he said to himself. If I go on like this, I shall become a crazy fool. This must stop. I, I promised the doctor I would not take tea. Faith, he was pretty right. My nerves have been getting into a queer state. Funny, I did not notice it. I, I never felt better in my life. However, it is all right now, and I shall not be such a fool again. Then he mixed himself a good stiff glass of brandy and water, and resolutely sat down to his work. It was nearly an hour when he looked up from his book, disturbed by the stu sudden stillness. Without, the wind howled and roared louder than ever, and the rain drove in sheets against the windows, beating like hail on the glass. But within there was no sound whatever save the echo of the wind as it roared in the great chimney, and now and then a hiss as a few raindrops found their way down the chimney in the lull of a storm. In the lull of the storm, even, sorry. The fire had fallen low and had ceased to flame, though it threw out a red glow. Malcolmson listened attentively, and presently heard a thin, squeaking noise. Very faint. It came from the corner of the room where the rope hung down, and he thought it was the creaking of the rope on the floor as the swaying of the bell raised and lowered it. Looking up, however, he saw in the dim light the great rat clinging to the rope and gnawing on it. The rope was already nearly gnawed through. 
he could see the lighter colour where the strands were laid bare. As he looked, the job was completed, and the severed end of the rope fell clattering on the oaken floor, whilst for an instant the great rat remained like a knob or tassel at the end of the rope, which now began to sway to and fro. Malcolmson felt for a moment another pang of terror, as he thought that now the possibility of calling the outer world to his assistance was cut off. But an intense anger took its place, and seizing the book he was reading, he hurled it at the rat. The blow was well aimed, but before the missile could reach him, the rat dropped off and struck the floor with a soft thud. Malcolmson instantly rushed over towards him, but it darted away and disappeared in the darkness of the shadows of the room. Malcolmson felt that his work was over for the night and determined then and there to vary the monotony of the proceedings by a hunt for the rat and took off the green shade of the lamp so as to ensure a wider spreading light. As he did so, the gloom of the upper part of the room was relieved and in the new flood of light, great by comparison with the previous darkness, the pictures on the wall stood out boldly. From where he stood, Malcolmson saw right opposite to him the third picture on the wall from the right of the fireplace. He rubbed his eyes in surprise, and then a great fear began to come upon him. In the centre of the picture was a great irregular patch of brown canvas, as fresh as when it was stretched on the frame. The background was as before, with chair and chimney corner and rope, but the figure of the judge had disappeared. Malcolmson, almost in a chill of horror, turned slowly round, and then he began to shake and tremble like a man in a palsy. His strength seemed to have left him, and he was incapable of action or movement, hardly even of thought. He could only see and hear. There, on the great high-backed carved oak chair, sat the judge, in his robes of scarlet and ermine, with his baleful eyes glaring vindictively, and a smile of triumph on the resolute, cruel mouth, as he lifted with his hands a black cap. Malcolmson felt as if the blood was running from his heart, as one does in moments of prolonged suspense. There was a singing in his ears. Without he could hear the roar and howl of the tempest, and through it, swept on the storm, came the striking of midnight by the great chimes in the marketplace. He stood for a space of time that seemed to him endless, still as a statue, and with wide open, horror-struck eyes, breathless. As the clock struck, so the smile of triumph on the judge's face intensified, and at the last stroke of midnight he placed the black cap on his head. Slowly and deliberately, the judge rose from his chair and picked up the piece of rope of the alarm bell which lay on the floor, drew it through his hands as if he enjoyed its touch, and then deliberately began to knot one end of it, fashioning it into a noose. This he tightened and tested with his foot, pulling hard at it till he was satisfied, and then making a running noose of it, which he held in his hand. Then he began to move along the table on the opposite side to Malcolmson, keeping his eyes on him until he had passed him, and with a quick movement he stood in front of the door. Malcolmson then began to feel that he was trapped, and tried to think of what he should do. There was some fascination in the judge's eyes which he never took off him, and he had perforce to look. He saw the judge approach, still keeping between him and the door, and raise the noose and throw it towards him as if to entangle him. With a great effort he made a quick movement to one side and saw the rope fall beside him and heard it strike the oaken floor. Again the judge raised the noose and tried to ensnare him, ever keeping his baleful eyes fixed on him, and each time by a mighty effort the student just managed to evade it. So this went on for many times, the judge seeming never discouraged nor discomposed at failure, but playing as a cat does with a mouse. At last, in despair, which had reached its climax, Malcolmson cast a, a quick glance round him. The lamp seemed to have blazed up, and there was a fairly good light in the room. At the many rat holes and in the chinks and crannies of the wainscot he saw the rat's eyes, and this aspect that was purely physical gave him a gleam of comfort. He looked around and saw that the rope of the great alarm bell was laden with rats. Every inch of it was covered with them, and more and more were pouring through the small circular hole in the ceiling whence it emerged, so that with their weight the bell was beginning to sway. 
Hark, it had swayed till the clapper had touched the bell. The sound was but a tiny one, but the bell was only beginning to sway and it would increase. At the sound, the judge, who had been keeping his eyes fixed on Malcolmson, looked up, and a scowl of diabolical anger overspread his face. His eyes fairly glowed like hot coals, and he stamped his foot with a sound that seemed to make the house shake. A dreadful peal of thunder broke overhead as he raised the rope again, whilst the rats kept running up and down the rope as though working against time. This time, instead of throwing it, he drew close to his victim and held open the noose as he approached. As he came closer, there seemed something paralysing in his very presence, and Malcolmson stood rigid as a corpse. He felt the judge's icy fingers touch his throat as he adjusted the rope. The noose tightened, tightened. Then the judge, taking the rigid form of the student in his arms, carried him over and placed him standing in the oak chair, and stepping up beside him, put his hand up and caught the end of the swaying rope of the alarm bell. As he raised his hands, the rats fled squeaking and disappeared through the hole in the ceiling. Taking the end of the noose which was round Malcolmson's neck, he tied it to the hanging bell rope, and then descending pulled away the chair. When the alarm bell of the judge's house began to sound, a crowd soon assembled. Lights and torches of various kinds appeared, and soon a silent crowd was hurrying to the spot. They knocked loudly at the door, but there was no reply. Then they burst in the door and poured into the great dining room, Doctor at the head. There at the end of the rope of the great alarm bell hung the body of the student, and on the face of the judge in the picture was a malignant smile. And that's the end. Crikey, okay, how are we doing? How are we feeling? How did we deal with that? Not great looking at the chat. Wow, that escalated, said Danny McNamara. Yes. Mmm. There we go. Can't stop the bee, says, and this was my first thought. Is that the first extremely grim murder we've actually seen committed in these stories? I think it is. I, like, you know what's odd? Is that, um... What's odd is that, is that these gothic ghost stories don't tend to end with the protagonist dying, um, which I always think is odd. I, I think, like, usually, usually, I think just with our modern horror sensibilities, the way that these stories end and everyone tends to be still alive, but having had a spooky encounter feels a little, uh, um, feels a little tame sometimes. Um, so I, I think, I think this is, I think this is the first ghost story where actually the protagonist died was killed by a ghost. The signal man died, but he wasn't murdered by ghosts, says uh, Segret, uh, Secret Agent Sam. Yes. Yes, good call. The signal man did die. Yes. Mm. That was the darkest one yet, says Dawn Seabrook. Yeah, that was my thought. That was my thought. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, the uh, the hand, the hand in the the beast with five fingers that did kill kill someone, didn't it? Although it was it was a little, it's different. It was kind of uh, like the protagonist sort of died off screen, if you like, at the end, off screen. Whereas this was a much more um, visceral description, I think. Um, yeah. So. So pretty dark i thought um what i think is really interesting about the end of that is the role that the rats play now i saw a comment way further up um i wonder if i'll be able to find it again um uh, a few people have spe a few people speculated it and i think this is really on the money rune factorous and Laslock and clumsy by fact so if the big rat is the judge i guess all normal rats are his victims yeah i think so because clearly those little rats the little rats that are like swarming in the walls are trying to save him at the end they're like they're they're swarming up on the bell and trying to trying to ring you know trying, trying to ring it um 
they're trying to help and i think that makes the ending a lot darker because when that starts to happen it looks like it's going to be a way out when i was reading it i thought ah here's what happens the these rats which are i think like the spirits of the judge's victims are gonna save him but they don't which is dark and creepy doubly dark and creepy because i think for the judge's victims that is a cruel sort of afterlife you know like you're now a a tiny rat spirit and you have to live in the walls and you have to be quiet when the evil king judge rat who killed you shows up mm, yeah mephi to go puts it nicely the big rat is the judge but the little rats are just as frightened of him as the common subjects were during his lifetime yes 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 Yes, it's very creepy. Very, very creepy. Gentle Mandrill says, oh, wow, the ending was dark. I think that was, yeah, I think that was the first murder of the protagonist. Usually at least one of the protagonists tells the story of what happened. Yes, and you often know that's going to happen because the story often begins with something like, I heard this story from such and such who told me about it. And like, in years to come, he would often recall that the thing's face looked like that of an octopus or something like that. Um, John Sharplin says, really like this one, one of my favourites so far. Protagonist actually died, and Stoker's writing was spooky, but still plain enough to enjoy. Um, yeah. Yeah, I thought this, I, th you know, I mean, it's... Uh... <laughs> Beth Bloomer says, okay, but seriously though, sensual mouth? Yeah, the judge is described as having a sensual mouth. Just got, a, just, just got, that, just got that sensual mouth. Some, some, people, some people are born with a sensual mouth. They're very lucky. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, Michelle eighty six says one day the rats will realise that he is one and they are many. That's nice. That's nice. Um. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah, I liked this one. I liked this one. I thought it was creepy, short to the point, and a very dark ending. And it really escalates. Um. Nicely paced. I think there are three appearances of the king rat, um, and then the the third is is um, you know just get it, just, it it yeah it just get, gets carried away and then suddenly the rat's gone and there's the actual judge. Blah. Fran Fry says, I made some more artsy stuff that I will post sometime soon. Themed to stories slash episodes of this stream. I hope you will like them. Thank you, Fran Fry. I'm sure I will like them. I enjoyed the last uh, piece of art that you posted. It was awesome. Um, yeah, that's cool. And thanks for the super chat as well. That's very kind. Thank you. Uh, King Rat is just misunderstood, says Denise L. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we've got 15 minutes. Um, uh, we've got 15 minutes before Andy... Uh, starts his photography stream he's going at nine o'clock now um uh so yeah uh l let's do some q a for 15 minutes um we've got we've got a little time um and then uh yeah and then we'll then we'll send uh oh yeah and then we'll then we'll then we'll send you over to watch that stream in fact andy asks in the chat what's the earliest book you've done so far and how far back do you think you could find oh, i actually don't know what the earliest one we've done is i think um We've not done anything that's in the first half of the 1800s. It all, it all starts happening in the latter half and in the early 1900s. Um, I would be interested to know how far back we can go. Let's try and read a really, really, really... Um, yeah, like trying it like a... Trying it really, really far back. Um... Hmm. But, but you know, to stick with the Gothic tradition, that really was emerging at around the time of these th things. So I guess that's that's kind of the... That's probably the limit. We can't go too much further back than that, really. <laughs> uh, okay, right. Let's, uh, let's have a look at some questions. Oh, Jam Dev here says, on the subject of the sensual mouth. Think for the Victorians, anything sensual was not to be trusted. Quite often the villains really enjoy food and drink and luxuries. Sensual doesn't have to mean sexual. Uh, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. <gasps> Leo Gorwell says, Hey Luke, thanks for doing these streams. Thanks to your readings, I found the energy again to go back to my own writing and started writing a short horror story set in a submarine. Amazing. Amazing. A short horror story set in a submarine. That sounds rad. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. 
Andy McPee says, who would win in a fight, Dracula or Rat King? Well, probably a Dracula. Let's be real. Um, Fancy Space Owl says, what do you think is it that makes gothic horror fiction so fascinating? I think what's so fascinating about it is I think of what it must have been like to be alive in Victorian times when, you know, it's not that far back, really, in terms of, you know, when you take all of history into account. It's not that far back, but it's still so much further back in terms of, like, science and understanding of the world. And and I just think it must there must have been so much that was terrifying, <laughs> like, in the world. And I'm just fascinated to know why victorians enjoyed ghost stories i guess i guess that's what i guess that's i guess when i read these stories i strongly imagine people um i strongly imagine like people reading them in a contemporary way like reading them at the time like w like trying to f like yeah i imagine i imagine victorian people reading them and 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 being and being terrified and being and being creeped out and i just think that that is a, i just think there's something about there's something about like the, the human um interest in scaring yourself on purpose that is very interesting and i think i i, I think that that's a, a nice like direct link between like modern times and this very and this particular uh like point in the past Oh, Annika Brock makes a good point as well. Says, I think I like it because it seems much more creative than modern horror. It hadn't fallen into tropes as much yet. That's that's true. So, like, if you're, um, if you're, if, you know, if you're in, uh, if you're in Victorian times, like, you wouldn't be writing this being like, oh my gosh, haunted house, how cliched or something. They must have just been like picking gold up off of the floor, you know, like none of these tropes have been shotgunned yet. Like no one's, no one's no one's take you know no one's taken all the good no one's taken all the good storylines yet they're not yet cliches um yeah cool it's cool yeah i like that idea it's it must have been it must have been very interesting to sort of be on the uh to be on the um to be on the to be on the edge to be on the bleeding edge the frontier of uh um uh, yeah, like of a new genre. It's cool. Um, Nora Blanche says, do you think there are dinosaur ghosts? We would hear them. If there were, we would hear them. They would be huge as well. Like, so it would be really hard for them to do an effective haunting, I think. Also, and this is odd, the spots where they haunted, uh, now the continents have shifted so much. It's possible that their haunting spot is now just like over in the middle of the ocean somewhere. That's a cool idea. Dinosaur ghosts in the middle of the ocean where a where a continent used to be. Hmm. Yes, that's good. Beth Bloomer says, Would you rather stay in a spooky haunted castle or camp in a spooky haunted forest? Um hmm. Castle or forest. They both sound horrible. Um, I guess Castle. So being in the forest. No 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 no. I used to have this really um I used to get this this creepy thought where I grew up when I was um uh um when I was a kid there were like woods near where I was growing up and I used to have this creepy thought whenever I went to the woods that as soon as I like put a foot in the woods like as soon as I stepped in as soon as I stepped into it all over the woods there were like werewolves or wolf creatures or something that were immediately alerted to my pres presence and, and started sprinting towards me and because the woods are huge it could be like it could be ages before they got to me but the only thing that meant that I survived every time I went to the woods was because I came to the woods and then left the woods before they could like reach me every time what is up with kids' imaginations? How do ki like how are how are children just able to imagine the the creepiest thing? And so I'd, when I'd go into the woods, I'd be like, if I turn back now, would I get out in time before they got to me? That kind of uh... <laughs> John Sharp then says, yes, Luke, please tell us how that made you feel. Here, lie back on the couch. <laughs> yeah, that's good. 
Emily Price says, OMG, that's an amazing idea for a story. Thanks. Um, and Rachik says, apologies to your younger self, but that sounds so awesome, minus the potential murder. <laughs> yeah. And Gaijin Gamer says, that's the only reason you're alive today. You were in and out in time. It's a good excuse for not hanging around um, in the woods very long. I think. Yeah. Beth Bloomer says, favourite horror story antagonist so far. Oh, but the best antagonist. Um... Probably the bundle of the bundle of sheets ghost from a whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. That was real. That was a real good ghost. That was. That was very scary. Yeah. OK, well, everyone's into. The, oh, um, the hand says the board captain. Yeah, the hand. The hand was so good. The hand was so good. Um, but the hand, that I found the hand, like, almost funny. Almost funny. Um, next time, by the way, we're going to go back to M.R. James, read another M.R. James story. And the antagonist of that is so good. And the, dis and the, antag the way the antagonist is described is so... <laughs> so horrible that I am... I know I'm going to struggle to get through it without laughing because it is funny. It is funny, but there we go. John Sharpton says, I really like the Canon Alberic demon. Oh, the Canon Alberic. Oh, yeah, oh, man. That was that, like, creepy demon thing with the long fingernails that had, like, its hands. And, uh, oh, yeah, oh, that was... Oh, man, yeah, that was... That was real creepy. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, it is almost time for uh, Andy Hoyle's stream. Uh, as I mentioned, if you uh, are only just joining, he is going to be doing something very cool, which is uh, he is going to be editing photos, Oxventure photos, uh, to D20 dice rolls, which is pretty wild, um, which is a really fun concept. And I am going to pop a link to that in the chat now. Andy's photo editing stream. There you go. And there's a link. Cool. Yep, that's uh, that's kicking off in uh, in just a little uh, just a little over five minutes. So yeah, uh, do go over there and and check it out. Andy has a great beard. And now I know you're going to have to click the link just to see his beard to verify that it's great. I know you now cannot resist. You've got to know what it's like. How great is it? What does Luke think counts as a great beard? You're curious. Give in to that curiosity. Click the link. Click the link. Should we say something themed, says Kobe Morris? Yes, absolutely. You should invade Andy's live stream chat with the phrase... Um, oh, what, what was it? Incont the incontinent thing. Let me find it. What was it? I want to get it right. Um... Fleeing incontinently. That's it. You're all you're all fleeing incontinently um, into into Andy's live stream chat. Katie Douglas says the draw of the beard is too strong. Gareth the Great says you duped me. Yeah, that's right. Fled incontinently. But does he have a sensual beard? Says Beth Bloomer. Yes, yes. Let us do a sprint. Says Shy Violet. Yes, let us do a sprint. Let us do a sprint. Um, and flee incontinently over to uh, over to that live stream and see how it goes. I will be watching along. Um, hopefully it stops raining here. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Um, this was another really fun. <laughs> Rajik says, let us do an incontinent sprint. That's quite an image. Um, yeah, uh, this was really fun. I really liked this one. Um, yeah, Bram Stoker come through understand uh, you understand don't you reading this why he's like maybe maybe the most famous horror author yeah maybe we should do dracula maybe we should do actual dracula as like a uh as like a, as a two a two-parter or maybe a three-parter 
It's not a very big, no long novel, is it? But it's, but it's still a novel. What do we think? Do we, would we want short stories, or would you rather a multi-parter where we do, like, an actual novel? I mean, give me a... Give me a... Give me your thoughts. Okay. Yep. Okay, there's enthusiasm for doing a whole book. That's cool. Um... Oh, Charles Snow, thank you very much for the super chat. Says, thank you so much. Charles, you're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. I'll, um, I'll, I'll consider the novel idea. But, um, yeah. I'd like to do... We've got to do a mix. Because uh, cause, cause the good thing about the short, short stories is that you get the... Um, you get the... You get, like, more characters. You get, like, more different characters faster. And I think the characters are really fun. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, some enthusiasm for Dracula or Carmilla. Uh, Carmilla is one that I've been. Carmilla is one that I've read. That is that that is quite short. We could do that in a in a few streams. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, a little bit, a little bit more of the hipster alternative predates Dracula. Oh, Dracula's really long. People, are, folks are saying it's great, but it's like a fifteen-hour read. Okay, all right, yeah, maybe not. Carmilla might be better, says Rebecca M. Yeah, Carmilla also really great. Okay, right. Look, quite a lot of enthusiasm for Carmilla. All right, all right. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, maybe we'll um, maybe we'll try Carmilla as our first multi-parter. That's cool. That's cool. Hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for watching. Um, I'm gonna pop another link in. Uh, to the chat, to Andy's stream. Go check it out. I'm putting it in with the words "tada." <laughs> there you go, tada. All right. Have a uh, have a lovely rest of your evening. Remain unhaunted, folks. MX Tay says thank you for brightening my day with horror. You and the chat are always lovely. Thank you, MX Tay. Thanks for the super chat. Yes. Um. And the the chat is always lovely. What a lot of fun these things are. Um. Yeah. All right. Cool. Take it easy. Enjoy Andy's stream. Remain unhaunted, folks. See you next time. Bye. Oh, wait. Hang on. Hang on. Go disappear. I always forget this. Here I go.